most ancient goddesses were portrayed as what is called now war goddesses. But, but in my view, they are pointing to this ferocity, rage, that elemental uh, energy of Rudra world, rather than the fact that they were uh, martial or they were uh, wanting to have inflict violent oppositional wars. So you've got goddesses that are often portrayed holding tigers by, their scr by the scruffs of their neck with both arms. Or you've got goddesses whose bodies are part, is, are part tiger bodies. And what these goddesses signal is this, um, this courage, ferocity, energy, vitality and strength that is needed to express this elemental connection, our connection with our, the wild in us, what is elemental or primordial in us. It takes courage, it takes ferocity, and perhaps that is a martial quality, that quality of a warrior courage. So you've got the ancient archetypal archer across so many different cultures. You've the central shamanic uh, archetype of the archer, poet, dancer, is healer is very prevalent across many archetypal traditions. I, I feel that over time, at least if I look at it from uh, the Indian cultural perspective, you have these goddesses then becoming more what they're called now as war goddesses, which, uh, which instrumentalized their ferocity or their rage. So it became that this rage and ferocity had a particular purpose and it was the purpose was to uh, defeat evil so we had this duality of good and evil and the benign goddess expresses herself as this uh, enraged ferocious goddess like Kali or Durga who then manifests to destroy uh, the enemies of the gods. So here Ferocity and rage is given a purpose. It is now constrained by a particular purpose. It's not elemental anymore, but it is almost as if you are allowed to be um, ferocious if there is a purpose and if somebody has, if the deities, if the gods have uh, asked you to, uh, to express yourself in this way. You're fulfilling, you're servicing a larger purpose, a more divine purpose of the deities. And then there is also the domestication of this rage. So in some stories, for example, the stories around Kali, her rage, which is often where she perceives that there's a betrayal by her consort Shiva, it becomes almost shrewish. It becomes as if Kali is behaving um, Un inappropriately and uncontrollably and it's not dignified and it is not a and it is not um, something to be some a woman-like quality it's not a divine quality and Shiva is then needed to control Kali and to bring her back into that uh, into the the domestic the balance and stability of the domestic sphere Kali is almost uh, said to be ashamed of her rage and sometimes there are even stories where uh, the fact that her tongue is out is because she is uh, you know biting her tongue out of shame. I do find this a real diminishing of that elemental uh, energy, wisdom and beautiful poetry and that connection that we are offered in the more primordial invocations of the deities such as Rudra and the early war god goddesses, that connections we have towards that wild beauty of nature and how we are a part of it and that we are not, even in our villages, we don't have to separate ourselves from the wild. I believe that this way of domesticating rage and by saying that it is something to be ashamed of and something to be controlled, it really diminishes those opportunities, especially in an archetypal invocation.